Hello, I'm Jeff Conaway. I'm the head football coach at Shallow Christian, and this presentation is going to be over our offensive practice planning. I hope that there's some things that I can share that we do at Shallow that might benefit your program. At the end, I'll share my email address and my phone number. If there's any questions pertaining to anything that I go over in this presentation, feel free to reach out. First thing that I want to do is just go over our practice plan. You can see here we have a practice plan, and this is a 23-period practice plan. The first thing that I always notice with practice plans are the segments, the periods, and the amount of time that we use for each period. And typically, the first three weeks of the season, we're a five-minute period practice plan. Once we get into conference, we move that five-minute period to four-minute, and we still try to get as much as we can possibly get done in those four minutes. We want our specialties to be something that we do every day, and we line up for our specialties, and we make sure that we are practicing all needs pertaining to our special teams, our holds, our snaps, our kicks, our punts, our catches, our everything that we can possibly generate a drill for pertaining to special teams. We want to start every practice, or at least early in the practice, with those particular drills. We do split our, split our offense and our defense. We are a smaller school, and therefore we do share athletes. And so our Tuesday plan does look a little different than our Wednesday plan. The Tuesday plan, we split, and we have time for our players to practice offense, and we have time for our players to practice defense. Our Wednesday plan, we do not. And so we do not platoon as much on Wednesday. You see our meeting times, our core value of the day, which is very important for us to continue to develop those core values during and after practice, and then the situation of the day. We've got ways in which we incorporate those situations based on the number practice that we have. One of the resources, one of the tools that we use in practice is this CoachCom tempo system. You see there we've got a segment timer and a period clock. We also have music. We want to make sure that we can practice in, a, in an environment where it may be difficult at times to communicate and force that stress, that opportunity to communicate, talk, and communicate with player to player and coach to player or even coach to coach. So this is something that we do use in practice. If you do not have something like this, obviously this coach com tempo system is, in my opinion, the best. We want to make sure that we always define this offensively. We want to create the most explosives that we can possibly create. And for us, an explosive is any pass that gains 18 or more yards, any run that gains eight or more yards. Obviously, our weekly go is to finish each game with more explosives than our opponent. And we set our standard to 15 per game. At times, that may be 12, that may be 18, but we just want to make sure that we've got a good goal for explosives in a way that would generate first downs and generate as many points as possible. The other big factor for us is ball security, and we teach high and tight as everyone does. We avoid switching arms with the football when we're, when we're carrying the football. And anytime we go through traffic, we want to secure the wrist or double up. And we've got a few different ways that we teach and coach the double up from the ball security perspective. We want to make sure our explosives, our ball security is much better than our opponents. And when it is, we typically win a lot of football games. I want to go over a few practice drills. The first is flex and cone drill. You saw on the practice plan, one of the first things that we do is obviously we want to try to get loose for the mind and the body. And we start on one sideline and we'll do four different dynamic movement patterns. We'll reset on the next sideline and we'll return and do four additional movement patterns in order to get the blood flowing, in order to loosen up the joints and activate the muscles and the mind. Once we finish with that dynamic flex, that dynamic warm up, we're going to go right into cone drills. And the cone drills that we use, typically we can get our entire team through two cone patterns in 60 seconds or less. 
And one of the reasons that we do cone drills before practice is because I want everybody on our team to understand that winners don't slip, losers slip. It doesn't matter what surface you're playing on. We want our football players to know how to accelerate, deaccelerate, and make sure they can transition and they can move their change of direction on any surface needs to be done with excellence and so we do cone drills. We've got several different patterns that we can use and I typically am in charge of the whistle and the signal. If I give them the NASCAR signal, they know that they're going around and they're gonna return. They're gonna do it just like you would in NASCAR. The figure eight, if I give them the figure eight, they know that they're going to work the figure eight pattern. We wanna stress three things when they get to that cone and these cones are 10 yards apart. We obviously want to go as fast as we can. We feel like early in practice, we need to exhort, exalt. We need to, we feel like early in the practice, we need to get their body going and we need to go full speed. So we want to teach when you get to that cone, as you approach that cone, we want your body level to lower. So we say sink your hips, we say get your nose over your toes, and we say accelerate your hands. We want a real tight turn around the cone and we want to burst. And we always say finish plus three. If that goal line is the end of the drill, we want to go plus three yards past. So the plus three finish, we really want to make sure our guys are activating the, those fast twitch muscle fibers early, early in practice in order to have an even more efficient practice. Our tackle turnover circuit is something that we do daily, and our tackle turnover circuit is something that our defensive staff has fine-tuned and placed a lot of emphasis on avoiding the player-to-player -player tackling and really maximizing the player-to-tackle resource tackle. And that may be a, that may be a will, that may be a dummy that may be any type of equipment that we can use in order to get a player on a tackle opportunity without using players to tackle each other. Our turnover circuit is something that in my opinion has improved our opportunities and every defense wants to create turnovers but the way that we practice those turnovers and the way that we drill every defensive player through those uh, those turnover circuits, I believe, is, uh, is done very effectively. The ball is the program is our opportunity each day to stress ball security, and so we will have several drills. Uh, in that ball is the program drill. We will make sure that our guys understand how to field a loose ball, and we call that city country. If there is traffic, then we fall on the football and we, we recover it and we bring our knees to our chest and we secure that on our side. We make sure that we have the football. If there is no traffic, we call that country and we wanna teach our guys how to scoop that, how to get the knuckles on the grass and scoop that football into their uh, high and tight position and advance the football. Our pick drill is another drill that we want our defenders to go as high as they can go, catch the football above their helmet, we teach them to choose the nearest, the cleanest sideline. We want the closest defender to the interception to go and make sure they take out, make sure they handle the intended receiver. And then we want to set up the convoy. The convoy needs to be set up at the top of the numbers with those defensive players blocking for the return. We want our return guy to be at the bottom of the numbers. If he gets bumped, we don't want him to step out of bounds. So running down the ticks or the sideline is not the most effective way. We want to make sure there's room to move if he is bumped, collisioned, tried to get, tried to, to get tackled on the bottom of the numbers. So those four areas, I believe, in our practice, I think those are, they're, those are areas that we really want to our QBs and receivers will do a drill that's called ABCs, one, two, threes. We will do this drill every single day. And in my opinion, this is just an opportunity for us to develop some confidence. I feel like if our receivers and quarterbacks can throw and catch with efficiency at the beginning of practice, I think they will throw and catch with much more efficiency later on in practice. And so these are simple 
opportunities for us to just teach how to place the football, where to maneuver our hands in order to catch the football. But you can see there, we line our quarterbacks 10 yards apart. We've got receivers on their right side, and we are just taking a circle approach to get through all of these catches. The first one you see there is on the nose, and we want to catch everything extended, eyes on ball, squeeze the ball, tuck it away. We want to make sure that we, as a receiver, know how to catch the football with our hands and not our body. And we also want to make sure our quarterbacks are throwing tight spirals in the right spot. And they're really just generating some confidence. The second one is the back shoulder. So we want to throw that football on the back shoulder. We want to reverse and do a complete 360. The third one is the high ball. We teach catch the football above your head, rip it out of the air, spin away from contact, and tuck it before your feet touch the grass. Then we will transition into our low ball catch. And we want our pinkies together. We tell our receivers to bend at the waist, stab the football, tuck the football, and accelerate. Our acceleration in this drill is we tell our receivers we want plus two. So we want to go two lines of full speed. We don't need you to run 50 yards full speed, but we also don't want you to just run two yards of full speed. We always want two lines. And so if you catch the football at the four yard line, you need to run full speed past the five and the 10. If you catch the football at the six yard line, you need to run full speed past the 10 and the 15. Once we transition to the next, it's the zoom or the jet, and we're gonna catch the football as a quarterback. We're gonna pitch that, so we believe that we need to work that in practice. And this is a very, very fast, effective way to get those zoom motions lined up as far as the timing between center, quarterback, and the motion man and also just taking care of the football. The sixth opportunity is the hitch route. And this is where we really start to go a little bit faster. The first five are at about 70, 80%. These next few are full speed. So we're gonna run the hitch, we're gonna run the out, we're gonna run the fade, and we're gonna throw and catch with efficiency on all three of those. Once we get to nine, we'll talk about the face-to-face. -face. The receiver lines up in front of the quarterback, the quarterback sends him, and the receiver catches that face-to-face -face ball. And it really creates a lot of opportunities for us to coach both the quarterback, the receivers, the running backs. There's, there's a whole lot of coachable, teachable opportunities inside each of these catches. And we want to make sure that we're teaching them the fundamentals of catching. I believe if we do this correctly, our quarterbacks are going to complete a lot of passes to start practice, which is always good. I believe our receivers are going to always catch a lot of passes early, which is always good. Again, we're trying to build confidence. We're trying to develop some muscle memory. We're trying to teach them the most fundamental elements of throwing and catching. And if we are going to be great at it, we must master this. If we do not master this, I don't believe we're going to be great on Friday nights. The next thing that we have in the presentation is our philosophy of great in the middle eight. And the way that we teach this is we want to stress the last four minutes of the second quarter and we want to stress the first four minutes of the third quarter. We feel like these are two opportunities inside practice where if we really, really get great in the middle eight, we can drastically change the score of a football game. If we can stop our opponent inside those four minutes of the second quarter, we can get the football back and we can go score. And then to open up the third quarter, if we can do the same, whether that's go score or stop our opponent, we feel like we can really stretch the margin of victory. We can stretch that score. And there can be, at times, a 28-point 20, swing if we are great in the middle eight. So the way that we do that is we typically will end our first half of practice with a competitive team session. Typically that's offense, that's offense going up against our defense in whatever the scenario may be. If we are on a Tuesday practice, that's typically a yellow zone opportunity. If we're on a Wednesday practice, that is a goal line opportunity. But we want that session to be highly competitive. We want that session to be intense. We want to be able to blow the whistle and transition to a halftime. That halftime will either be a five or a four minute period, but we want our players and coaches to be able to push pause, be able to reset, and be able to relax, if you will. In that time, we will also talk about 
our sideline etiquette and our sideline protocol. We want our, our football players to have their toes on the gray line. We want their helmets on, their mouthpiece in. We want them to be ready. But that is a time that we're trying to make feel as if it is a Friday halftime by giving them that opportunity to push pause, reset, and start up in the second half. So we will follow our halftime with special teams. And typically during that five or four minute period of halftime, our special teams coordinator is coaching up the next phase of practice. The next four or five minutes will be a special teams unit. It might be kickoff return, it might be kickoff, but he's gonna give them instructions. We're gonna get our scout team ready. We're gonna get everybody on the line and then we're gonna blow the whistle and we're gonna transition into that special teams unit. We wanna stress being great in the middle eight, the second half of practice, just like we did in the first. And so we will add an additional competitive team session somewhere early inside those four minutes and try to get our guys to make sure they're, they're making the most of that middle eight opportunity. Again, halftime, we wanna reinforce where we stand. Our toes are on the line, our helmets are on, we're engaged in practice. And I really believe that if you want your players to act a certain way on the sideline during the game, you need to have a plan in place and practice to coach them and teach them what that expectation is. I feel like we have a good understanding during the week through practice and also during the game of what really our sideline should look like. Our dress code is as follows. On Monday, we have a core value of enthusiasm and every Monday throughout the entire 365 day calendar, our players know it's blue shirt on blue shorts. On Tuesday, it's white or gold shirt on blue shorts. And you can see there, the expectation is for our players to look like they belong to us. We want to make sure when people see us, we are uniform, we are supporting and wearing our school colors and our logos. I'm not a big fan of multi-colors. And so we tell our players it's white cleats, it's white accessories. If you want to wear gloves, that's great, wear white gloves. If you want leggings or armbands or whatever that may be, if you wanna wear an undershirt, it needs to be white. And I really feel like this unites us. I think there's power in it. I think there's a sense of unity when everybody knows the expectation, they all look the same. And we certainly want our guys to, to look well and play well. During practice, if we have injured players, we tell them that our expectation is if you're hurt or injured, you're gonna dress out. We expect every player to dress. If there is rehabilitation that needs to take place, that will be assigned. If they cannot do one of those two things, dress and rehabilitate, then additional duties will be assigned. Some of those duties might be filming, they might partake in filming from the press box, they might have a drone duty, they might help with some other drills, but we really wanna stress everybody dresses out every single day. And the only real injuries that would prevent that would be some sort of injury where maybe a player is on crutches and they just can't participate. So we certainly will find a task for them to do. We don't want anybody to stand on the sideline and not bring value to our practice, and so we expect everybody to be involved and give us the best that they can give us. We do allow our ninth graders to participate once a week. They practice with our senior high every Tuesday. After their season, they do get promoted and they become a part of our senior high football team. I really believe that this generates a familiarity of how we run our senior high program and really gives our ninth graders an advantage moving into their sophomore season. If we have 15 weeks of football, that means they get 15 Tuesday practices. They also, after their season, will move up and get those additional playoff and championship practices with our senior high. So you can see that there's several opportunities for our ninth graders to feel like they are ready as a sophomore because they've gotten so many practices with our senior high football team. Our scout team preparation, I really believe that there is such value in this. Our coaches typically will address the team before practice and they will meet with the scouting, the scout teams. They will uh, coordinate which player 
personnel is in whatever unit that may be and also who's who's doing what. And so the scout team preparation for both offense and defense and also special teams, we typically will do before practice and make sure we are prepared during practice. As far as our coaches and our expectations at practice, you know, some of the things listed on here refers to a Thursday early morning practice, our sprint through practice. And I really believe that as a head coach, we have to define what we want our coaches to do while they're on the field. We can't take anything for granted. We can't assume that they know what the expectation is unless we tell them. And so I want to make sure I'm clear with make sure you're here at this time and make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're enthusiastic. Bring the juice and your whistle. It is a practice. I want you to use that whistle. We talk about coaching up your stretch lines, hold them accountable to do it the right way, attention to detail, coach your position during every special teams, enhance your personnel exchanges, and just make sure, be a step ahead, don't be behind. Um, just make sure you're on the field using your practice plan, be on time, um, don't be a zoo tiger. A zoo tiger is a tiger in which someone's always telling him what to do and when it's time to do it. Time to eat, time to move, time to exercise, time to sleep. We want coaches that understand how to get things done, take the initiative, be ahead, make sure you're well planned. You're not forcing someone to tell you what to do. You're able to go out there and lead and be the best coach of your position. So you can kind of see some of the expectations we, that we lay out for our coaches. We want to correct or confirm every rep. There shouldn't be anybody standing around not doing anything. We want to use our hand and our mouth. Uh, we want a very polished practice, and, and really it, it starts with us. So if we're going to practice well, we've got to make sure we're ready to coach well. And some of the best coaches that I've been around says that players don't have bad practices. Coaches do. And I've over my time coaching, I feel like I'm getting closer and closer to believing that is true. If we want to have a great practice, we must bring the great coaching to go right along with that. Additional drills, some of these drills we do in practice and some of these drills are uh, on the screen because I just want to share a few things that maybe we do a little bit differently. The screen drill, we typically will have four stations of screens and we've got units of our offense that move through each of those four stations. At one station, we might have the back out screen and a coach there coaching the back, back out screen. As soon as they get a rep of the back out screen, they transition to the now screen or the perimeter screen. When they finish the now screen, they move to the tunnel. Whatever those screens may be, we feel like our screen drill allows everybody to do a few things. We're always moving, we're all getting coached. Instead of one unit getting coached on one particular screen, we've got four units getting coached on a particular screen. And so our screen drill is done a little bit differently and uh, we like the way that has gone. Our RSBP, that is a reverse shot boot or play action. Again, we can set that up the same way, but for the most part, we just want to really focus on those things. We want to make sure that we're investing a little bit of time over the entire season to just make sure we are securing up how we run our reverses, how our shots are protected, thrown, caught, um, working on our boots, working on our play actions, whatever that may be. But RSBP is, a, is, a, is an interesting way for us as coaches to make sure we're not neglecting any of those and very, very important concepts. Our inside drill, we're always gonna set up two groups. And one of the coaching points with our inside drill is I want everybody in our organization to know where those two footballs are going to start, what hash, what yard line, and I want them to know what those first two plays are. I'm a believer that if you know where the drill is going to begin, you know how to begin it, and you can do it without a coach on you, I feel like we're going to get quality reps. We're going to get quantity of reps, and we are very, very keen on making sure our guys know where that drill is going to start, knowing what hash, what yard line, and what the play is. In scale, we do the exact same thing. Our players know that on Tuesday we're going to start on the right hash at the 40-yard line, and they know that the first play is going to be Cardinal. They know on Wednesday we're going to start on the left hash on the 40-yard line, and that first play is going to be Louisville. And so 
teaching them how to start typically will generate more reps and I believe that it forces practice to go a lot smoother with a lot greater tempo. As far as our team, we've got three different tempos that we use. We will use a whiz tempo where our defensive players are flying by the ball carrier and tagging off. This would be done in scale. We've got our thud tempo, which is a hit wrap up leg drive. Typically this would be done in all of our inside drills. And then we've got a live where we're gonna hit, wrap up and take to the ground. We don't do a whole lot of live. As a matter of fact, we very seldom do any live. But if we did, we obviously would put our knee pads on and our pants on and we would, we would go after it. Our team sessions are generally thud. If there are times that we need to get a live look, then obviously our guys know when we flip that switch and we say we're live, they understand the tempo of the drill. Communication, one of the things that we did this year that really advanced our communication and allowed us to be even more efficient as a staff was we did wear our Coach Com headsets. And that was something that we did every practice and it increased our ability to communicate, to talk back and forth, to help players transition, to coordinate and organize personnel, to maybe repeat plays or to get a scout team defender to do this, a scout team play to run at the defense to make sure we did this. It was just an easy way for us to continue that communication through practice where we didn't have to stop practice, we didn't have to slow practice down. We could communicate as a staff extremely efficiently. The other thing that we did this year is Coach Com also has a new device and technology called the player receivers. These are small radios that are Velcroed into a pouch and put on the arm and coaches can, through the Coach Com headset, talk to their players and give them those subtle cues that they need to be successful in practice again without having to slow down or stop practice. For me, this was critical. We had a sophomore quarterback who I felt like needed me to give him as much as I could give him throughout each practice. I could stand behind him in scale and I could talk about the pre-snap alignment. I could talk about any movement. I could talk about his progression. And again, I could do that from anywhere on the field. If I wanted to stand behind him and get the visual, I could do that. If I wanted to be on the sideline and coach him up, I could do that. Uh, so that's something that I feel like in our communication this year, we did, a, we did a great job of maximizing that through those two devices, the Coachcom headset and the Coachcom player receivers. I believe this in closing, that a coach will impact more young people in a year than the average person does in a lifetime. So if you're a coach and you're watching this, be encouraged. What you do is powerful, it's effective, it will make a huge impact, so make sure you're doing it extremely well. And then if you have any questions and you want to contact me, if you want to email me, you see my email there on the screen. If you want to call, you can call, but I'd be happy to answer any questions, go even further in some of the ways that we practice in order to help and to, to provide uh, maybe some, some new options, uh, alternatives for you. So thanks for listening. 